Hello guys and welcome to the Beyond Sana channel, my name is Shanks. In today we are going to create a tier list for all the units in Battle for Middle Earth 2, the Rise of the Witch King. We are going to start with the Black Numenorians from the Engma faction, the Elite Swordsmen from Engma. In order to be able to recruit them, you need to first of all invest money and time to get your Hall of the Kingsmen to level 2 and also invest 400 resources for every single one of these. Now, they are the most expensive Swordsmen in the game, but not the strongest, trust me on that one. They have a really long build time, they are quite squishy against arrows, and for a faction like Engma, which has not the best resource income from all the factions in the game, it's kind of hard to afford to get many of these units on the field, and most of the time you have much better choices, and for that reason I'm gonna place them in the C. They are still kind of good because they have charge attack, so they are not the worst units, but also not the best. Now we're gonna move on to the Dark Rangers, and in order to get them on the field, you need to get your Hall of the Kingsmen to level 3 first, and also invest 500 resources to recruit these units. And what I would always suggest you to do is buy the banner carry upgrade from your Hall of the Kingsmen to get them to level 2, which will unlock the long shot, which is super easy for the Engma faction to hit. All you gotta do is cast the long shot from the Rangers, and just before you hit it, use the Felwind ability from your spellbook. This way, the enemy units won't be able to get away and you will potentially be able to kill the entire backline and they are one of my favorite archers in the game. For that reason, I'm going to move them to the E, just because they are not the best. The next unit on the list are going to be the Hill Trolls from the Engma faction, from the Troll and Wolfden level 2. They are one of the tankiest, if not the tankiest, pikemen in the entire game, but they are also the most expensive pikemen in the game. However, I don't like them. Now you might call me crazy, Shanks, but they are so good. No, for me they are not good because they are not able to get trampled down. That's a bad thing by the way. The enemy cavalry can go through you and you will not deal damage to them. That's horrible, <laughs> let's be real. And for that reason, and also because they are so extremely expensive, I'm gonna place them in the B. The next unit on the list are going to be the wolf tanks from the Engma faction. Now I like these units a lot. They are the best counter, mobile counter by the way, against enemy pikemen. They can eat the enemy pikemen alive, especially when you get the heavy spike collar upgrade on them, which is like an armor buff. You can make them tanky enough to fight against anything else, like swordmen, like archers for example, but mostly you can combine them with your wolf riders, your wolf riders being used for a trampling down the enemy big line, and these units will be eating the pikes alive. And for that reason, I'm gonna place them in the A for sure. And the next unit on the list are going to be the Sorcerers. And oh my goodness, I mean, I'm speechless, useless like crazy. Glass cannons, extremely slow, getting killed in a second. And you need to build the Temple of Twilight to get the chance to recruit them and upgrade your Temple of Twilight to unlock some shenanigans, which are hard to hit because once again, you will get one shotted from any source of damage. Since you are not able to get away, since you are immobile, you will not be even able to dodge the incoming damage. Don't recruit them in a serious game, you will lose. The next unit on the list are going to be the Extrovers. Now, as you guys know, from the Engma faction, you are able to recruit the Trailmaster units. And those Trailmaster units, they have the chance to transform into Extrovers, Gundabad Warriors, Pikemen, and Wolf Riders. That makes the Engma faction great. The Trailmaster units, they have like a Downside, but also upside. The good thing about the Trailmaster units is that they don't need to have a level 2. They can always recover even when they are level 1, but on the other side, you are not able to make them any stronger. So they are, they are like an early game and a spam unit, but not like the craziest and the strongest units in the entire game. And for that reason, it's good early on when you have some extra overs on the field to defend yourself, but they will fall off late game. However, most of the games are decided in the first 10 to 15 minutes and in this period of time the extroverts can actually have a huge impact on the game and for that reason i'm gonna place them since they are also very cost efficient to the e-list the next unit are going to be the pikemen like mentioned before you are able to turn your trial masters into the pikemen as well just to counter the enemy cavalry not the best pikemen quite squishy but they are you know doing what they are paid for they are here to counter the enemy cavalry units and you know they are good enough and again, they are quite cost efficient. And you having the chance to always decide for each trial master what you want to get them into is actually making this faction kind of crazy in my opinion. And for that reason, I'm gonna place them in the B. Just because they are kind of squishy, they can get also one-shotted from like a spear of Eomea or Eowyn, for example. Um, I don't know this unit, by the way. I mean, you are not able to recruit a white with the Engma faction. That's not possible. For that reason, I'm not gonna place them at all. 
Now we have the Wolf Riders on the list. Wolf Riders, once again, are able to get from the Trial Master. Wolf Riders, once again, you are able to recruit them by recruiting the Trial Master from your Hall of the Kingsmen and then pay a little bit more resources to turn them into the Cavalry. That makes the Engman faction so crazy that you are able to get in no time all kind of units you need. You can get Pikemen, Extrovers, Gundabad Warriors and Wolf Riders from two buildings all alone, which gives you an immense of early pressure and early advantage against your opponent. And yeah, of course, they are not the best cavalry units in the game. They are indeed one of the worst. But you having the chance to get them on the field extremely fast makes them, for me, extremely reliable. And for that reason, I'm going to move them also to the B. Now, next on the list are going to be the Trial Master units. We are talking about that all the time. Trial Masters, once again, have the chance to transform into all the mentioned units like before. And they cost only 200 each. So they are slightly more expensive than Goblin Warriors. But I, for me, I like them so much because they have the chance to, you know, of course they have a weakness too. When the Trauma Master dies from a battalion, you will lose your entire battalion. But uh, most of the time, if you are actually being careful, if you, you know, kind of pay attention, that's not going to happen or at least not many times. And for that reason, we're going to place them in the S tier, our first member in the S tier. Next on it on the list are going to be the Waldman of Dunland. The Waldman of Dunland, they cost 150 each. So they are also a little bit more expensive than Goblin Warriors, but they have the pillage built in their kit. That means every time they attack enemy units, you will get money. And the same money you get is the money your opponent will lose. So it's a win-win situation in my book in all terms. They are not the best fighters in the game, but they are one of the best units for harassment. So if you can sneak a couple of them into the enemy, side of the map and you can actually destroy some of the mills some of the malone trees or whatever resource buildings they got you might get so much value from that and for that reason i'm gonna place them also in the e-list next unit on the list are going to be the snow trolls from the engma faction from the level 2 troll and wolf ten. they are the tankiest cavalry units in the game by far and they are also one of the most expensive cavalry units in the game which is okay but they are so unique the reason why they are so unique is because that's the only cavalry unit in the entire game that has a charge attack. I mean, doesn't make any sense. Actually, you are a cavalry and you have a charge attack, but it is how it is. That's going to give you the chance to be buffed. Like a Warchan, for example, that's going to increase your DPS and your armor by 50% each, which will make you win every trade against any other horse. And But they are so expensive, but they are still reliable. I like them a lot, and for that reason, I'm going to place them in the E. The next units on the list are going to be the Dwarven units. We're going to start with the Extrovers from Dwarves. Kind of situational unit, not like a rush unit. Uh, what you can always do is you can make like a strong front line with like Guardians, Pikemen, and then you have like Extrovers behind your army to support the army with additional DPS. Remember, Extrovers are not only hitting hard against units, but also hitting extremely hard against enemy buildings. And they are also kind of cost efficient, 250 each. And they are definitely better than these units. But I'm not going to rank them as up as this unit. The reason is simple. Because getting this units on the field, you need to first of all build a archer range. While Engma can get those units on the field from the same building. For that reason, extrovers from dwarves are going to the B. Next on the list are going to be the, <coughs> Next on the list are going to be the battle wagons from the Dwarven faction. You can recruit these from the level 1 Forge Forks in the Rise of the Witch King. They are very unique. They cost 500 each, but then you can actually invest even more money into upgrading them with additional stuff. For example, banner, which means leadership for the nearby allied units. For example, well, which means sustain for the nearby allied units. Or you can give them extrovers or men of deal to deal damage either against buildings or also units. So for that reason, I like them a lot, but you need to be careful because the second they get touched from the enemy pikemen, they're going to go down and that's going to cost you a lot of money. But I like them. I don't know why. I feel like when you are good with microing the units, you can actually keep them alive for a long time and that might be a nightmare for your opponent to deal with. And I'm gonna place them also in the A. Now the next one on the list are gonna be the Dwarven Builders. Uh, that's not a unit for me, but if it would be a unit, it would be definitely the best builder in the game. The reason is simple, Dwarven Builder, if you don't know, gives you the most vision. So as you guys know, when you move around with the build in the darkness, every build has like a sight, like a vision. Dwarven Builders have the most advanced vision, so you are able to see a little bit more in compared to the Builder from the Men of the West, Goblins, Mordor, and so on. Next unit on the list are going to be the Dwarven Catapults. Now, I believe in long terms, these are going to be the best Catapults in the game, but first of all, you need to get the Flaming Shot from a level 3 Forge Works, which is easier said than done. The game needs to last a while 
for you to get the chance to do that. Most of the time, units we don't really see. And the reason why I'm not gonna rank this up in the list is because dwarves don't need siege weapons. You have Gloin, who's a siege weapon himself. Guardians with siege hammers also hitting like a truck against buildings. So I believe Dwarven Faction generally doesn't really rely on the siege weapons since your units are, are already siege weapons. And for that reason, I'm gonna place them in the C just because I feel like they have not enough value for the Dwarven Faction to be higher in the list. The next units on the list are going to be the Men of Deal. Men of Deal are the elite archers from the Dwarven Faction. And again, you need to get your archer range to level 2 if you want to get them recruited and to level 3 if you want to upgrade them with Fire Arrow Upgrade, which is gonna boost your damage especially against buildings they have also the black arrows which can actually burst down enemy monsters for example so and also black arrows you need to know is able to extend your range so when you want to shoot and just before the enemy gets out of the range you can still cast the black arrows and eventually burst them down one of the best archers in the game and um, but of course there are much much better what makes them so great is they are one of the few archers by the way who are able to get heavy armor which can make them also quite tanky especially against horses this way you're not gonna get one shotted when you get trampled down but still lots of money additional building is needed and required for you to make them useful and for that reason i'm gonna place them in this seat next unit on the list is going to be the demolisher once again a siege weapon from the dwarven faction um, the best situation for you to use that is actually building a siege works or fort works next to your opponent's base because if you want to try to get this demolisher from your base to the enemy base, trust me, you need to walk ages since it's extremely slow. Once you get to the side of your opening, you can deploy it for additional armor, which makes it almost unkillable. And it's also able to trample down enemy units like Swartman, for example, they will get trampled down if you go over them. But again, like with the catapult, dwarves, they don't really rely on the siege weapons most of the time. And for that reason, I'm going to place it also just like the catapult in the sea. Now, we have the Dwarven Zealots. These are the elite fighters from the Dwarven faction. In order to recruit them, you need to get your Hall of Warriors to level 3, which is going to take you a lot of time and even more money. And they are not worth it. They're extremely expensive, still squishy against archers. And most of the time, you should be just going for heroes like Gimli, Gloin, or Zane, because I don't feel like they are valuable in Rise of the Witch King at least, and for that reason I'm gonna place them in the D. The next units are going to be the Mighty Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, one of my most favorite sportsmen in the entire game. The only weakness, and the biggest weakness at the same time, is the lack of mobility. They are quite, quite, quite slow. So, in order to make them useful, is uh, in order to make them useful, you actually need to build multiple mineshafts, and then use your mineshafts as like a tunnel connection network, so you can get from one side of the map to the other side of the map without having to walk. When it comes to walking, you will not be able to chase anybody, catch anybody, while other units will be always catching you. So running away is not an option for the mighty guardians. When you are being chased down, just stand and fight. But they are cost efficient. Once they get the chance to hit, they are hitting like an absolute track. They have the chance for the siege hammers, which can open for you a possibility of going for a sneaky attack on the enemy fortress. And yeah, you can actually make a great use of these. For that reason, I'm going to place them also as the leader of the A. Next units are going to be the Dwarven Pikemen, one of the best pikemen in the game, in my opinion. You are able to recruit them from your Hall of Warriors as a counter unit to the enemy cavalry and to the enemy mounted heroes. The same like the Guardians, they are hitting like a truck when they get the chance to do that, but the lack of mobility, they are extremely slow. And your dwarven gameplay should always include your builders building lots of mineshafts in the entire map. That's the only possible way for you to win the matchups as dwarves against any other faction. And just like the guardians, I'm gonna place them also in the A. Now we are done with the dwarves and we are going to start with the elven faction, starting with the Lorien archers from the barracks of elves. One of the most used archers in the entire game. They cost 300 each, are great for harassment against enemy units are great when it comes to defend your settlements against enemy units and they don't fall off either you can always recruit them and rely on them elven gameplay keep in mind is kind of relying on the archer army so as elves you want to build many many archers to defend yourself and they are good for that and for that reason i'm going to place them also in the a not because they are the strongest but actually because they are one of the most used units in the entire game next on the list are going to be the next on the list are going to be the lorian warriors Lorian warriors are the swordmen from the elven faction from the barracks. 
kind of only used in the early game. Because late game, you don't want to recruit them since they are not the strongest units. But just like the Lorian Arches, also Lorian Warriors are able to get stealthed around the trees. They are quite mobile. That means you can actually start recruiting them at the beginning of the game and use them for harassment. So I like them, but late game you won't see them anymore. Late game you will see Alvin Arches only with some pikemen to protect your Arches against the enemy cavalry units. For that reason, I'm going to place them in the B. Next on the list are going to be the best arches in the entire game, the Mirkwood arches, guys. Holy guacamole. These arches are just crazy. When they have the silver tone arrows, guys, GG well played. Trust me, just quit the game. <laughs> I mean, nobody is able to out damage them and nobody is able to out range them. That means they can shoot you before you even get the chance to see them most of the time, which makes it almost impossible for you to deal with that. Nobody is able to win against elves in an archer against archer battle. So in order to be able to take them down as the opponent player, you need to recruit many, many Gondonites, Rohirrim, Spider Riders, Snow Trolls, just to get into the backline. The weakness is of course, obviously, the lack of armor. They are glass cannon units, so they are all about dealing damage, but they are not good enough to receive damage. They can get one shot most of the time, but hitting like a truck, that's what the archers are supposed to do, and they are the best in that. For that reason, S tier, hello, here I am. Next on the list are going to be the Mifflon units, the pikemen from the Elven faction. Of course, not the best pikemen, but they are the only possible choice for the Elven faction to keep your Mirkwoods and also Lorien warriors protected against enemy heroes and cavalry units. And they are good for that. A couple of patches ago, they were also able to get invisible around the trees. Now it's removed, which is a huge nerf for the, for the pikemen of elves. But they are still one of the most used elves because Elven faction has no other choice. And for that reason, I'm going to place them also with the Lorien Warriors in the B. Next on the list are going to be the Mighty Ants from the Fangorn Forest. The Siege Weapons from the Elven Faction. In order to recruit them, you need to build first of all a Ants mode, of course. And yeah, they are not the best Siege Weapons in the game, but they are extremely tanky against anything but Pikemen and Fire Arrows. Which, let's be real, if you have like enough Arches around your end, the enemy Pikemen should never be able to get close to you. And it's very unlikely that at this stage of the game your opening is gonna have fire arrows. So when you have them on the field, you ideally will have some protection to keep them protected against pikemen. And then you can, you know, start sieging slowly but surely. And also ant mood can be used to recruit the daddy of the ants, who is of course Treebeard. I like them, they, are, they cost 700 each, so they are not the cheapest. But unlike all the other factions, which you need to upgrade a building to level 2 or level 3 before you can get any switch weapons on the field, uh, elves, can just build the end mood and get them on the field a bit faster this way. For that reason, I'm going to place them in the B. Next on the list are going to be the Revandal Lancers from the Stable of the Alvin Faction. They are not the best cavalry units in the game, of course, but they are good for harassment. They are good for trampling down enemy archers or the enemy swordmen. They are reliable. And Alvin Faction is based on the archers, so they will never have the strongest cavalry in the game. But they are also not the worst cavalry in the game. For that reason, I'm going to place them in the B since they are good enough to do what they are paid for and this is harassment of the enemy resource buildings and trampling down enemy backline like archers or swordmen. Next on the list are going to be the Nolder Warriors, the elite and special unit from the Alvin faction which can be only recruited if you get your barracks to level 3. But I like them more than the Zealots because they are ranged and they have also the change to switch to the sword which can be used in some situations if you want to deal damage to the enemy buildings for example. Because they are ranged, they are so much more reliable in all terms than the Zealots will ever be. For that reason, that's gonna be the one of the few units I will be placing as a special unit anywhere higher than the D. Next on the list and the last unit from the Alvin faction are going to be the Linden Horse Archer units from the Stable Level 2. I like them. They are the best Horse Archer unit in the entire game. And if you ever get the chance to upgrade them with the Silvertone Arrows, guys, you will need nothing else anymore to win the game. Silvertone Arrows gives you kind of like a magic damage, which hits like a truck against summons like Balrog, for example. When you have a couple of units with Silvertone Arrows, you can even kill Balrog, Summon Dragon, anybody in like a couple of seconds. And Silvertone Arrow is also like knocking back the enemy units. So now you have a horse which is going to be like a hard counter to the enemy pikemen. So imagine like you can, with the album faction, build yourself like a huge army, which is mobile by the way, with the lances and the horse archers, then you have enough DPS against buildings or more DPS against units. It's like a crazy combination of course, you need to invest a lot of money and time to do that, but it is worth trying it out, you will like it, trust me. 
For that reason, I'm going to place them also in the B. Let's now start with the Goblin faction, shall we? Goblin Warriors. They cost 100 each, are the fastest swordsmen in the entire game with the Poison Blade. Now, they are not the strongest 1v1 swordmen, which is kind of obvious because they are one of the cheapest, but they are a spam faction. Like, I'm talking about having 5, 6, 8 goblin cubes at the same time and spamming goblins everywhere. Use the massive advantage of having like a horde, like a full army of goblins everywhere and they can out damage any army because they have the horde bonus. When gathered in numbers of 100 or more, they will be passively dealing 25% more damage, which by the way is able to stack with war chant and with leadership and with spell from darkness for example. With that being said, they might not be the weakest, uh, they might not be the strongest, but they are one of the most efficient ones and that's gonna be our first swordsman in the S tier list. Next on the list are going to be the Goblin Arches and oh boy, I wish I could say the same things about the Goblin Arches like I said about the Goblin Warriors, but I can't, I can't. They are one of the worst arches in the entire game. The only good thing about them is they have the poison arrows, which means you can deal burst damage to a selected enemy unit or hero, and you can poison them to make them receive damage over time, you know? And this got buffed recently against, you know, heroes like a Nazgul, Felbis, or the Witch King or Trolls from the Mordor faction, because the matchup right now is still broken. So as goblins against Mordor, it's kind of tough for you to win the matchup, and they receive the buff, but again, every other Archam you have covered so far, Mirk Woods, Lorien Arches, everyone, everyone is better than them. So they're going to be, I believe, one of the worst Arches in the game. I'm going to place them actually in the D. Next on the list are going to be the half Troll Pikemen from the Fissure Level 1. And I don't like them as well. For the same reason why I don't like the Hill Trolls, because they are not able to get trampled down, which makes them kind of like a horrible choice against Gondor Knights, Rohirrim or anything on Horse, really, or on Spiders. And... They might be tanky, in melee fight of course they're gonna beat and win against cavalry, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of a pikeman for me personally is, I wanna have an army, I wanna have pikemen inside my army, this way I can protect my army from getting trampled down. And with these units it's impossible, because the, the units are like getting through them. They get not, I mean they, I mean the pikemen are not able to get trampled down, but because they are not getting trampled down, they're also not able to deal any damage when the enemy units are riding over you, if this kind of makes sense for you guys. And for that reason, I don't like them. They cost also 400 each, so it's expensive units. They are tanky and stuff like that, but that's the reason why I'm not going to rank them any higher but on the C. Next on the list are going to be the Mountain Giants from the Goblin Faction. In order to be able to recruit them, you need to get your Fissure to level 3 first. And they might be hitting a little bit faster than the Ends from the Elven Faction, but... There are two things I want you to understand. First of all, you need to get your fissure to level 3, which is going to again cost you time and money. And second, and most important thing is, they are more expensive than ants, and they are more squishy than ants. So arches, normal arches for example, can kill them way way easier than they can kill the ants. Ants, they have like a huge resistance against arrows for example, while giants are much more squishy. So in many situations when the enemy has like a good defense, the Giants are going to be much, much easier to deal with for the opponent player than the Ants. And for that reason, they're going to still be in the B. But for me, they are a bit worse than the Ants. Next on the list are going to be the Cave Trolls from the Fissure Level 2 from the Goblin Faction. Um, for me, they are kind of bad. The reason is simple, because the amount of units or buildings you need to kill with this Cave Troll to get them to level 2 is kind of insane. And that's the only possible way for the cave troll to have self-sustain, to be able to heal up over time. Otherwise, the troll is going to be always on low HP after receiving some damage. And in compared to the mountain trolls from the Mordor faction, I would always prefer to play with the mountain trolls instead of the cave trolls. Because I believe in 99% of the cases, the find an orc to eat ability is just much better than throwing a goblin on the enemy units. And for that reason, I'm going to place them on the sea. And also, of course, Mountain Trolls, they can be recruited from a level 1 Troll Cage, while Cave Trolls can be recruited only from a level 2 Fissure. The next on the list are going to be the Spider Riders, one of the most expensive Cavalier units in the game. They have the chance, just like Rohirrim, to fight with Sword and Bow. Good for trampling, but I would say they are not the best Cavalier units in the game, and also quite expensive for the Goblins, especially early mid-game. And for that reason, I'm going to place them on the B because they are still better than Lances from Rivendell. 
but also more expensive and you also need to invest time to get your spider pit to level 2 first. Next on the list are going to be the spider links. The spider links are units from the spider pit level 1. They are good for harassment. So they are quite mobile, quite sneaky and you can always try to destroy enemy resource buildings left and right. They are dealing decent amount of damage. It's more like an early game unit but they can do lots of work for you if you are a player who is looking to play with micro intense units you're gonna like the spider links trust me on that one and i'm gonna place them actually into the s tier because early game is the most important stage of any game in battle for middle earth games next on the list are going to be the half troll swordsmen oh boy these are my most favorite swordsmen in the game now it makes kind of sense because they are not getting trampled down from the enemy cavalry units makes them to the only swordman in the entire game that can actually fight a Gondor Knight one on one. That's crazy. They have also charge attack, which gives them the chance to trample down the enemy units and also get 50% more damage and 50% more armor. They cost the same like Black Numenorians, but in 99.9.9.9 of the cases, they are just much, much more reliable and much, much, much better than the Black Numenorians from Engmar. Not only because they are immune to be trampled, but also Goblin faction has generally more resource income than an Engmar faction. So getting these units on the field is a bit easier for the Goblins than getting Black Numenorians on the field for the Engmar. For that reason, you might call me crazy, but S tier Swordsman there is. And we have now two Goblins, Goblin Warriors and half Swordman Swordsman from the same faction moving on to the S tier. Next on the list are going to be the Fire Drakes from the Goblin faction. Fissure level 3 is required to recruit them. Horrible, <laughs> horrible units. I wish in this game that those expensive units or heroes would be a bit more impactful than they are right now. Because in order to get these units, you need to invest lots of time and money to get your buildings to level 3 and they get one shot from a Mirkwood battalion. That makes them kind of impossible because they are like a semi-range unit, but you have not the same range like an archer. And if your opponent is smart, he will see your units before they actually get into the range and he will just hard focus your fire drakes and your fire drakes are gonna be taken down before they ever get the chance to attack one single time which makes them horrible in my opinion and for that reason they're gonna be in the D. Next on the list is the big fire drake from the goblin fortress. Pretty much the same situation like with the small fire drakes. Also very vulnerable against archers. When they get level 5 they have inferno and stuff like that but the question is how can I get there? Because such a big investment of dragon nest, of investing even more for the unit itself, which your opponent can counter with like two archer battalions, doesn't make any sense to me. Next on the list is the big giant eagle from the fortress of the elven faction. And this one is a bit different. In some matchups, this actually is gonna be a great choice. Against goblins, for example, because goblins, they struggle when it comes to deal with flying heroes or creatures. And the eagle will have also like a special ability, the wing blast. And because it's a flying unit, it can only be targeted from archers. And again, goblin archers are horrible. <laughs> and for that reason, there are many, many matchups. You have a flying unit. You, be, you are going to be quite fast. You can, in the worst case scenario, use them for a map control fight. Just fly around, kill furnaces, tunnels, farms, left and right. Get even more and more power points collected over time. For that reason, they're going to be actually in the B. Next on the list are going to be the Vipan of Talent. Pretty much the same situation here um, like we have seen before they are definitely one of the better swordmen in the game so they are the same unit by the way hillman and white man of Thailand. they have not only a different picture a name but they are the same unit for that reason they're gonna be also in the e next on the list now we are moving on to the isengard faction are gonna be the vork riders ladies and gentlemen vork riders are kind of unique because they have also like a whole ability which can be replacing the war chant fully which gives you the chance as Isengard to build up a Warg Pit and pick the Kribin from your spellbook. Because you don't need the buff of the Warchant, since you have a Warchant in your kit with the Warg Packs and Warg Riders, that means you can, in a fight, buff yourself with the whole ability and debuff the enemy units with the Kribin to get yourself a huge advantage in this combat, which can make you win those big fights. And for that reason, since they are reliable, they cost the same like the Revendal Lancers. They of course fall off in the late game, but early game they are good for Isengard, especially because Isengard has such a crazy eco in the mid to late game in which you can spam them all the time. They have also the support of the Sharku, of course, for additional leadership. And they can use Hole and Sharku's leadership at the same time to have the double buff action going on and use Kribane on the enemy units to debuff them to get yourself a huge advantage. I'm gonna move them actually also 
to the B, but a little bit above the Revander Lancers. Next on the list are the Urukai. Remember, this is not Rubble of Mindless Orcs. These are Urukai. Their armor is thick. And their shields are not broad enough. They cost 400 each. They are not feeling as strong as they should be, in my opinion. Definitely worse than the half Thrust Swordsman. They are tanky with the shield wall formation. But it feels like since the armor fix a couple of patches ago, in which they hardly nerfed the units like Soldiers with the shield wall and Urukai with the shield wall, it feels like it's much, much easier for you to take down the enemy Urukai in no time. And also 400 for a Swordman is kind of crazy in my opinion. Especially because you have no other choice besides Batman of Talent from your clan setting. So yeah, of course, uh, they are better than Soldiers, they are better than Lorraine Warriors, but they need to be because they are also more expensive. I'm gonna move them unfortunately only into the B. Next on the list are going to be the Uruk Pikemen from the Isengard faction. One of, the, one of my most favorite Pikemen in the game, I like them, they are fast as hell, so they can run pretty much at the speed like the Urukai can, which makes them, of course, much, much better than, like, for example, uh, the Pikemen from the Gondor faction. And for that reason, I'm going to place them in the E-list, but in the first place. Next on the list are going to be the Uruk Crossbowmen. Uh, I'm going to place them, actually, in the D. I don't like them. They are not very reliable for me. They can only be used at the beginning of the game, like a, like a counter infantry unit to protect yourself against something like Goblin Warriors or Orc Warriors. But in the mid to late game, Isengard has the chance to recruit some Wildman Extrovers, which are, in my opinion, more reliable, also cheaper than Crossbowmen. For that reason, I'm gonna place them in the D. Next on the list is the Berserker, a very underrated unit from the Isengard faction. The reason might be actually because you need to get your Uruk Pit to level 2 first to be able to recruit them. Great in some matchups, for example, against Mordor or against Goblins, meaning against those spammy factions who are spamming Goblins or Orcs on you all the time, you can recruit these which is going to give you the splash damage and you will be able to kill those orcs slash goblins in no time, but also kind of expensive for a single unit only. I don't know. I feel like uh, I'm not going to place them any higher but C. I feel like I also believe that I don't have the knowledge yet about the berserkers because I barely see them in the game. Next on the list is the ballista, one of the worst siege weapons in my opinion. Slow, not very good against units unlike the catapult from Mordor, unlike the trebuchets from Gondor, unlike the catapult from the Dwarven faction. So it's pretty bad against units. You don't have many more choices as the Isengard when you want to go for a, for a long distance siege against your opponent. But yeah, there are most of the time better choices. Next on the list is the Explosive Mine. I'm not going to place it any higher but D. In the last three years in which I've been hosting 1v1 tournaments for Rise of the Witch King, I haven't seen them one single time. Not a single time. Because if your opponent is paying attention, he will be able to see them coming before they are arriving. And he will be able to kill them in no time. So only good if you are against a very... A beginner skilled player who is not paying attention and you can deploy it then actually boom it and it will deal massive damage of course but it's just hard to get there for that reason d we're gonna move on now to the rams also uh yeah when it comes to go for them when you have a lead and you want to finish the game they can be great but again uh, not a mid to late game unit which siege needs to be in my opinion normally you want to go for a siege then you have enough units to protect them and you have, then you have no choice or then you have no reason of getting ramps on the field for that reason d now we have the uruk deathbringers and yeah the same situation like the zealots very very bad units quite expensive uruk pit level 3 is required for you to get them on the field and they will just get one shotted from archers so for that reason d Warp packs from Isengard, uh, I like them a lot. I like them equally as much as the Spiderlings. They are a good early game unit with the whole ability. And then with Creep in from the Spellbook, like with the Warp Riders, you can actually win those fights against Soldiers, for example, against Lorien Warriors, for example, against Goblins and Orcs. Anyway, and you can deal always economical damage because they are quite fast, mobile, and it doesn't hurt you if you lose them because they are also cost efficient. Next on the list are going to be the Wildman Extrovers. Definitely the better choice in compare to the Uruk Pikemen. Also better, in my opinion, than the Dwarven Extrovers. But you need to get your Wildman of Dunland or Clan setting in this case to level 2 before you get the chance to recruit them. I'm going to place them also in the A because they are like a solid, very reliable mid to late game unit. Remember, Extrovers also, if you don't know that, are a great counter to the Flyers. For example, you are playing Isengard against Mordor and he has Felbis on the field. Just get some Extrovers and you can burst them down in no time. Now we are moving on to the Men of the West faction, ladies and gentlemen, starting with the Gondor Archers. I'm gonna place them actually in the C. They are better than Goblin Archers and Mordor Archers, but I still don't think they are reliable enough to 
keep getting them on the field in long games. And it's always worth for the Man of the West faction to go for an early transition into the Archer range level 2 to be able to recruit some Rangers instead. Next on the list, we have the Hobbits from the Dwarven faction, which you are able to recruit from the inn. So after creeping a troll layer, for example, you capture the inn with dwarves, and that's gonna give you the chance to get some hobbits on the field. The best inn units in the game by far, very cost efficient, hitting like a truck, a great and cheap counter to the enemy heroes too, because if you don't know, hobbits are dealing like a special damage, because if you don't know, hobbits are dealing increased damage to the heroes, and you can always choose to fight with the swords when you wanna deal economical damage to the buildings. For that reason, I'm gonna place them actually in the S tier. Next on the list are the peasants, uh, the worst in units in the game, in my opinion. They're cost efficient for the Alban faction, which means you can use your in like a, like a second barracks. Actually, we can place them maybe also in the sea because they are kind of cost efficient. Next on the list are the rangers from the Man of the West faction with the long shot pretty similar to the rangers from the Engmar faction. While the Hall of the Kingsman has to be level 3, while the Hall of the Kingsman has to be level 3 for you to get the chance to recruit some dark rangers, your RGA range from the Man of the West faction has to be only level 2. Remember, Hall of the Kingsman is being used for many, many other stuff. While Man of the West has to build multiple different production buildings like Stable, Barracks, Archer Range to get the same units like Engmar can from one single building. And also it's easier to hit the long shot from the Dark Rangers because you have the Felwin from your spellbook, while the Rangers from Man of the West can only guarantee a hit when Boromir is around with the Horn of Gondor, which has a counterplay with the Fear Resistant, while Felwin has no counterplay. For that reason, I'm gonna actually uh, place them in the B, but they're gonna be the leaders of the B. Next on the list are the Rohirrim from the Man of the West faction. Rohirrim are kinda good, they cost the same like the Spider Riders from the Goblin faction, but they will only be quite effective if you have a sportive hero like Elme or Tyrion riding with them and give... And ri <laughs> riding with them and sporting them with additional damage and armor leadership. Other than that, very expensive, Man of the West is kinda struggling eco-wise in the early mid-game unless you are going for an early marketplace with the Grand Harvest, it's gonna be hard for you to be able to recruit many of these Rohirrim. For that reason, I'm gonna place them also in the B, but they will be the best cavalry unit in the B. Next on the list, we have the special and elite unit from the stable level 3 from the Men of the West faction, the Knights of the Lamrov. Uh, I like them because they are mobile, so they are, for me, a bit better than the Dwarven Zealots and the Uruk Deathbringers. I'm gonna place them also in the C, just because it's hard to get them on the field. Again, your stable has to be level 3, costs you time, money, and also a lot of money has to be invested to recruit these units. So it's a late game unit. And if you have this much money, get Gandalf or any other hero on the field instead. Next on the list are the Gondor Knights from the stable level 1. Good for early pressure, good and even better if you have Elmia or Theoden riding with them and sporting them with additional damage and armor leadership. Remember, leadership is able to stack with the Warchant or in this case, Rallying Cole, to sport your Gondor Knights with double buff, to make them hit like a truck, make them also tankier. So pretty nice if you can combine that with Eomer. Not the best when you send them alone. So when you want to make a huge cavalry army, it's always great to recruit those mounted heroes from Rohan like Eomer or Theodin to sport them with additional damage and armor. You can also place them in the A because they are cost efficient, they cost 500 each, and they are one of the best early game cavalry units in the game. Next on the list are the Soldiers of Gondor. I wish they would be a bit stronger. They are definitely slower than the Lorien Warriors. They are also weaker than most of the good swordsmen. The only units they are able to beat are actually from the normal swordsmen, the Goblin Warriors and the Orc Warriors. Other than that, they will lose against almost every other swordsman in the entire game. Very useful early game units because that's the only way for the Man of the West player to pressure the opponent from a barracks unit. So, but they will fall off big time in the mid to late game in which they have no value anymore because Man of the West player has to make a transition into something stronger than that. For that reason, I'm going to place them actually in the C. Now we have the Tower Guards. Tower Guards are the elite pikemen from the Man of the West faction and what makes them so bad in my opinion is not only they are extremely slow, but also you need to get your barracks to level 2 first before you get the chance to recruit them. For that reason, I'm gonna place them in the C, just because it's so hard for the Man of the West faction. Remember, Man of the West faction is such a strange faction in which you have to build like four different production buildings to be able to get the same units like other factions can do from one or two production buildings all alone. And then, you also need to upgrade your barracks to level 2 to be able to recruit these units. 
doesn't make any sense for me. One of the worst factions in the entire game because of that reason. I don't like the situation with the Man of the West in Rise of the Witch King right now. And for that reason, because it's so hard to get them on the field, we're gonna place them in the C. Next on the list are the Rohan Spearmen from the Man of the West faction, the Tier 1 from the Barracks Level 1. Um, not the best pikemen in the game, let me tell you that much. Like any other Tier 1, like the Miflon Sentry Unit, for example, from the Alvin faction, the Dwarven Pikemen, the Uruk Pikemen, like literally any other Tier 1 unit is able to beat them. And for that reason, I'm gonna also place them in the C. Next on the list, we have now the Mortal Unit Mountain Troll. And like I said, Mountain Troll is a little bit different than the Cave Troll because you have to sustain even when you are only level 1. By eating an Orc, you can heal up yourself. But same situation with the Cave Troll. In order to be able to get level 2, you need to kill a lot. Like, you need to kill a lot. You need to kill so many farms, so many units just to be able to get to level 2. While like a Soldier Battalion can get level 2 in no time, for example. It's a monster troll, it's a monster of course, it's fast, it's good for harassment, it's good against massive units like the goblins or mortal orcs. Just get yourself a tree in your hands and just keep hitting like a truck all the time. Next on the list we have the mountain troll from the mortal faction and like I said before, I like them a little bit more than the cave trolls because they have to sustain by finding and eating a orc for the self-regeneration. For that reason I'm gonna place them in the B. And also, it's easier for the Mortal Faction to get them on the field, since you don't need to level up your building to level 2, while Fissure has to be leveled up to level 2. Next on the list is the Drummer Troll, a sportive, but also impactful unit from the Mortal Faction. With the Roar ability, you can actually cause fear on the enemy units, make them run into different directions. And other than that, of course, we are having leadership for the nearby allied units to make them deal a bit more damage. Now, Gothmog can do the same work early on, but remember Gothmogs, Leadership is only working for the Orcs, while Drama Troll can give leadership to every single unit from the Mordor faction. Also, they are underrated because the requirement is to get your Troll Cage to level 2 before you get the chance to recruit them. For that reason, I'm gonna place them also in this C. Next on the list, we have the Attack Trolls from the Mordor faction. The requirements for the Attack Troll is a level 3 Troll Cage, and you also need to invest a thousand resources for every single one of them. Mordor has a good eco in the very late game, but still, that's a lot of investment for one single attack troll. The level 2 ability, the dominate troll, is useless in many, many, many situations and only useful in very few situations. So I'm not counting that as an ability because in most matchups it's just absolutely, because in most matchups it's just absolutely useless. And since they are so expensive, I don't think they are valuable in an actual 1v1 game. And for that reason, I'm gonna also place them in the D. Corsairs of Umba coming up next from the Mordor faction. Haradrim Palace level 2 is the requirement for you to get the chance to recruit some Corsairs. Very bad units in my opinion. Quite expensive and most of the time you have much much better choices. Orc Warriors coming up next. Orcs, they are the cheapest swordsmen in the entire game. It's a spam unit. You need to make sure to spam units all the time. They are good for the Mordor to survive the early game and get to the mid to late game. I like them a lot, I feel like they are quite reliable because they also cost you only 30 command points which gives you the chance to spam lots of these orcs even when your command points are low. Next on the list we have the orc archers, pretty much the same situation like the goblin archers, I'm gonna place them actually next to them, kinda useless unit in long terms, maybe good for the first two attacks to defend yourself against the enemy goblins for example, but they will fall off big time. And now we are moving on to the Muma kill from the Muma kill pen. Uh, what can I say? 1600 resources need to be invested into the slowest unit in the entire game. And a couple of archers or pikemen can take him down in no time. It's a, like a meme unit. Uh, it's like a Christmas, by the way, when you see him once in a year on the field in a 1v1 match. Other than that, it's like an undercover unit, which you will not be able to see anytime soon. Now we are moving on to the Easterlings from the Haradrim Palace level 1. Pretty good pikeman unit from the Mordor faction to counter the enemy cavalry units early on. Of course not the best pikemen, but definitely, definitely better than the Rohan Spearman units. And for that reason, I'm gonna move them on to the B. Next on the list are the Haradrim Archers. The elite archers from the Mordor faction. They cost the same amount of money like the Dark Rangers from Ingmar, or the Rangers from the Men of the West faction, or the Men of Deal from Dwarves, for example. But in order to be able to recruit them, you need to get your, Har you need to get your Haradrim Palace to level 3 first. However, they are having the Barbed Arrow Shot, which can also deal massive damage. And once again, Mordor's economy in the mid to late game is kind of good, that you will get the chance to recruit them easier than Men of the West sometimes will get the chance to recruit some Rangers. I'm gonna actually place them 
also next to the Man of the West Rangers in the B. Next on the list is the Mordor Catapult. That has to be the most seen siege weapon in a 1v1 game because Mordor likes to build the siege works to also get some Black Riders on the field later on. And you are struggling with the Mordor against the Alban faction. Just listen to me and in your next game build the siege works and get some catapults on the field. That's the best counter to the Alban gameplay since these catapults they don't need Firestone. They have always Firestone from the beginning and they are hitting like a truck against the enemy archers. So pretty good investment. The best and the most valuable siege weapons in the entire game since they are easy to be recruited and also easy to be used. For that reason I'm gonna place them actually um, into the B. Now we have the Haradrim Lancers from the Mordor faction level 2. Haradrim Palace is the requirement for them. Uh, pretty solid, uh, pretty much like the Wolf Riders, not the strongest cavalry units in the game of course, but uh, good enough for an uh, evil faction like Mordor to have some, you know, riding uh, units on the field you can control for harassment, for trampling down enemy archers and stuff like that, but definitely no Gondor Knights, definitely no Revendal Lancers, so we're gonna place them in the C. Next on the list are the Black Orcs, and uh, that might be a bit confusing for you, but I'm gonna move them actually to the S tier. Black Orcs are so underrated. They cost 250 each, and once they get to level 2, they unlock the Blood Thursday, which means 25% more damage passively, which always is able to stack with War Chant, with Leadership from Eye of Sauron, and with Darkness from your Spellbook. And with level 2 all alone, you will be able to outdamage most of the enemy Swordmen. It means you will be easily able to fight against Lorien Warriors, you will be easily able to fight even against Guardians when they are level 2. And that's not it, you have even the Horde bonus later on. You are able to buy them upgrades like Forge Plays and Heavy Armor, they are so reliable, they can make even more though to a really strong early game faction, let me tell you that much. Next on the list we have the Black Riders from the Mordor faction, the requirement for that is a level 3 Siege Wargs. And they cost 2000 each, but you are only able to get one of them recruited at the same time. They are the best elite unit in the entire game. They have a passive debuff to, to make the nearby enemy units weaker. And they are also one of the best counters to the hero spam. So if you want to be able to take down the enemy heroes, Black Riders should be your unit. And for that reason, I'm gonna move them definitely to the B as a leader. Just because it's so hard to get them on the field since they are so expensive. Next on the list we have the Galadrim Warriors, the in units from the Men of the West faction. They cost 400 each, so they are the most expensive in units in the game. They are pretty much like the Noldor Warriors able to fight with sword and bow, but they are not the best swordmen, they are not the best archer in the game either. Uh, yeah, also very expensive for the Men of the West faction to be honest with you guys. For that reason I'm gonna move them also to the C. Next on the list we have the Trollstone Thrower from the Engma faction. Uh, yeah, D. Trebuchet D, because you need to build a Siege Works, yet another production building from the Gondor faction. And then you need to get it to level 3, if I'm not mistaken, or level 2, for you to make them effective with the Firestone. Now we have the Gundabad Warriors from the Engma faction. You can transform your Trial Masters into the Gundabad Warriors, which are the Swordmen for the early game from the Engma faction. Pretty nice, pretty solid units. We're gonna move them also to the E list next to the Extrovers. And the last units are the Haradrim Spearmen. And now that's a special case. These are the special units from the Inn of the Mordor faction. And that's the only ranged counter, which is like an archer by the way and a pikeman at the same time. It's like a combination of these two. But it's a ranged counter to the enemy cavalry. For example, you are playing Mordor against Gondor, or Man of the West in this case, and he is spamming lots of Gondor Knights. Just get these units on the field, trust me. They are going to murder the enemy Gondonites from a long distance also, that's crazy. I like them a lot, I'm gonna actually move them to the B. I believe they are quite underrated. And yeah, that's gonna be my list boys. We have Trial Masters, Mirkwoods, Goblins, Spiderlings, half Troll Swordmen, Wolfpacks, Hobbits, Goblins and Black Orcs in the S and every other one you can take a look into that as well. Thank you so much for watching, if you would like to change anything from this tier list, what would it be? Please let me know in the comment section down below, I will see you next time, until then, keep hitting like a truck and as always, stay beyond standards. Peace out!